Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hey. Good to see you all. Happy holidays. Yes, happy holidays. It's good to remember. Now, now I'm hearing a little echo. Who am I hearing that from? Is everybody's audio on in the... There's no echo. Oh, I'm echoing. You're echoing? Yeah. Why would it be you? I don't know. Could people mute themselves? For some reason, everybody is unmuted for no reason. Um, I don't know why that's Last happening. On the order. Uh, Let me just mute everyone. Yes. Okay. Continue. Ask all to mute. Ask all to unmute. Larry Lobo is here. Wow. Hi, Larry. Okay. Sorry. For, you know, one second here. Is that has everybody muted themselves? It's good now. There's no echoes. Okay, good. Very good. All right. So let's see here. Let's get let's get going with a little bit of an introduction. And then uh, we'll dive in. So I'll just give the old uh, give the old the standard introduction. Yeah. But I'll give it some flair. Um, so comforting. That standard introduction, so comforting. So comforting, excellent. All right, well, Piano Tech Radio Hour, this is where you are. And want to remind you, is being brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, an online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more at www.pianotechniciansmasterclass.com dot com and today yeah. it's my good friend david anderson here and i and we're going to uh primarily we're just going to review this convention that we just had and bring about our thoughts and maybe do some highlights for people who couldn't be there give you a sense of what you might well, yeah maybe uh, maybe rip off everybody's best thing that we got and yeah tell totally all these guys yeah I mean, the first thing, first thing that I am is right off the top of my head that uh, I took away from the convention is wool, is just how fascinating it is that people who are great with piano tone are also sometimes interested in the details of wool and sheep and where does it come from and how long are the fibers and you know, how are they treated in the, in the process of going from wool to felt? And uh, that was the trippiest thing that Alex said that Steingraber pianos, they, they use Renner hammers, but they demand that the sheep is from this certain kind of Australian sheep. That's the only wool that will go that they'll that they'll have in their hammers. Don't you find that now that is whatever it is, you know. That's yeah. Being very specific and intent. Talk about a an obsession with felt. There's one. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, something else I took away from um from the convention and just in general, and I take away from other things often, is this that people who do things well, they often have some idiosyncrasies to what they do that might appear obsessive and oh. might seem like they don't matter to someone else. And so it's, this is a really good case in point. So they're gonna make sure that they have merino wool and it's a specific type of wool from a specific type of sheep. And that's going to be important to them. In Australia. Gonna, in Australia, right. But but so, the reason that they do it is because they said it, it was the longest fiber they found. The longest fiber they found. And they feel, they feel like long fiber is springier and less packed in than shorter fiber. 
and that's why they feel like it sounds best and it and it uh enables sustain mm -hmm. yeah talking about Just, the talking about the wool fibers as tiny little springs as well that's right and, and you talked it, i'm sorry go ahead no you can go ahead because you sound like you have something you also to say. talked about what i talk about all the time which is what what he calls sustain you know the sustain of a piano what i call making a piano sing he said you you enhance the sustain of a piano by the work you do and uh can't remember who first i heard this from maybe spreeman spreeman i think it was michael spreeman said look Every pianist I've ever dealt with has wanted the same thing, which is sustain. Everybody in every genre across all piano styles wants sustain. The amount of attack is different. The amount of, you know, uh, the color of the notes are different, but everybody wants that singing tone so that's really what we're voicing for and regulating for and tuning for so says alex kirsten who's one of the best piano technicians i've ever met and who's now the head of production for steingraver making 80 of the world's greatest pianos every year another thing of course that came out of discussions about voicing and wool was the range the importance of range to a pianist so you you talked about pianists want that sustain but they also want that range of colors and uh, there's um i think alex specifically talked about it as an orchestra an orchestra right if you're a pianist you want to have as many instruments as many voices as many tones that you can have and within that discussion he talked about how uh and i'm mixing it up a little bit because i know david stanwood talked about felt and wool as well in his discussion of voicing but um one of them said you know you want to really maximize the range of volumes that you can get uh alex i remember specifically said the the anyone could really play loud and of course there's there's details and be able to make a piano a bit louder but he was said you know i really focus on making it quieter or yeah. not necessarily making it quieter but making the pianist able to play softly and have that be on demand and exactly. softly and forcefully at the same time he said right. something about that too i need to be able to be confident that when I'm playing soft, each note has a force and can be played easily. That I don't have to dig for piano, pianissimo, pianis. You know, that that, right. that that you don't have to try it; it just comes. Yeah. The other part about it is, um, he he echoed what we learned from. Uh, Chu, Frederick Chu, about wanting various tone qualities that they can get because there's grooves in the hammer and that right. you, know, you never want to get rid of the grooves. You want to leave a slight groove. And he didn't, he actually, without talking about um, using the shift pedal at all, uh, Alex from Steingraber said that that was an important thing that having the grooves there gave the pianist a little bit more range and then when you look back at the lecture from frederick um he's talking about well not only that while i'm playing the piano but when i'm using the shift pedal i can have all these different degrees of tone quality as i shift the pedal again the the what, what was the word you used the 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 range, range. of yeah no but you used another word of 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 color the range of color and tones and timbre that it, it you said that not only sustain is important but this this other word i can't remember what it was yeah the the 
I don't know what I said before either, but the word that comes uh, to me again is he was talking about, I don't know if he used this word specifically, but it made me think of it orchestral, right? It's like I have tone qualities. I have different choices. I can do this and I get a little bit of that. I can do this and I can get a little bit of that. And he, he highlighted that, you know, there's places where you can create the ability for variety and variability within your voicing. And if you leave them alone and you don't do anything there, well, then you've closed off some options to the pianist. But if you address right. those specific issues, then the pianist will have more to play around with, more color, more tone quality to play around with. And the good pianist will take advantage of it. And the less experienced pianist who may not even know about it, I'm certainly will be able to learn about the variety of tone qualities that they have by having them at their disposal. <clears throat> Another thing so that's, uh, how did, how, how was Stan would, uh, I missed that class. Uh, oh. How was Stan, how was Stan Wood's uh, 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 felt thing like or different than Alex? Well, I think, well, what was really interesting about how they were similar is just the kind of going to the sheep and talking about spending some time to talk about sheep. <laughs> which is just fascinating. And David in particular, his wife is a felt artist and she makes right. clothing and things like that. So he has a uh, specifically, yeah, he has a specific view. He has sheep on his property, you know, that are hanging yeah. out there. So, you know, David, you know, Alex went back and talked about the sheep and where they come from and the importance of that. But David went in and he talked about, you know, a relationship with the sheep and shearing the sheep, you know, and he, he talked about, um, he, he gave some interesting metaphors about how the sheep is like always wanting to be, uh, the wool after it leaves the sheep is always wanting to be back on the sheep. And then that somehow gives it like a, a part of its uh, life and vibrancy. Be this, he, he talked about the springiness of the uh, of the wool fibers using those type of metaphors, which is interesting. But one thing that uh, David Stanwood did that Alex didn't was show some like electron microscopy of, you know, microscopic images of these wool fibers you know, and, and showed some uh, biologically, you know, diagrams, uh, cross sections of what the fibers are made of, what type of biological materials they're made of and why that gives it the quality that it does. Did he show the did he show the electron microscope photographs of a hammer that's been basically hot pressed and then a hammer that's been that's been pressed at a much, much lower temperature? I think so. And do you know what would have looked different about that? Because I can confirm. Oh uh, yeah. Tell me. In in the in the in the hammers that are pressed for between 30 minutes and an hour at 150 or whatever, the fibers are all bunched together on, on, a, on a microscopic, you know, 100 times level. The fibers are all bunched together. They're all wadded up like this. On a hammer that's been at 115, 110 or 115 degrees for 20 minutes or half an hour, the fibers are, are like almost like branches on a tree, not quite, like a bundled sheaf of wheat, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's bundled, but it's loose. It's yes. quite extraordinary. Yes. And that's why the vast majority of quality piano hammers today are made with less heat and less time in the press. Yes, I believe you did show those images. And I think that another analogy was kind of like uh, all the aeration that you see in the piano hammer is what gives it its springiness. And that, that springiness is very uh, essential to creating the, the right tone. And at the microscopic level, in the cold press hammers, you see the more spaces in between. And so that gives it room to compress and expand um, and give the, 
the springiness that allows for better tone. Another thing, another interesting heuristic that, that Stan would give is that on soft playing, you're really dealing with the exterior of the hammer and you want that felt on the exterior to be soft, you know, so that you can really take advantage of that extra springiness and um, tone quality that you get from that. But then as you go deeper into the hammer, you want more, you want it to be more compacted and more hard so that when you yeah. play at a louder volume, that hardness can bang right through the soft areas and give you the volume and the quality that you want. Um, so he, there was sort of like a spectrum where at the edge of the hammer, it's very focused on soft quality playing. And then as you move deeper and deeper, you're basically going louder and louder into the tone of the piano. And do you remember that Alex said that without exception, they stiffen the bottom of their hammers from where it meets the molding to up to the staple, if there's a staple, nine mm. o'clock and three o'clock mm. with a very weak solution of lacquer, like six to one, something like that, six acetone to one lacquer or whatever. Um, and that basically all tier one makers do that. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Yes, for sure. Um, so the other thing that I'll say to, to transition into another topic, which we could talk about, or we can go keep on wool, but that idea of caring about these details that you might not be certain matter at first. And um, Sally Phillips, I think, stands out to me the most uh, when it comes to that. And she's got Piano Perfect LLC as her brand but she's kind of a perfectionist <laughs> and I often see her doing things and I'm like, wow, okay. So that matters, you know? Um, um, so she brought in a lot of really useful little tweaks that I think uh, I would just say it from my perspective. I might, I might, I might have an intuition this matters, but I would go, ah, come on, Ethan, you need to focus on something else. Like just, you know, get the basics together. This, this may not even count. Right. Don't pay attention to that. Um, and she brings in a lot of fine detail into the work she does. And I think it underlies why she's so um, appreciated. Absolutely. That's why we should segue right into her. Uh, she, she had, as you say, literally a wealth of little tips and tricks. Uh, and if, Ethan, if you could bring the ones that hit you uh, the hardest, that'd be great. Yeah, I think two things come right off to mind. And again, I, I don't, I feel like I might appear a little uh, dense if maybe other people already know about this, but for me, they were interesting revelations. I did learn them. Uh, she did bring some of these things out in a previous lecture. So I was already aware of them, but at the time that I first learned them, they were very intriguing. Um, you know, just taking a hot, like a knife and putting it on a uh, iron to heat it up and going over the felt on the whippin, uh, underside of the whippin, the heel, as mm -hmm. a means of improving the, I believe it's for the friction, improving the, reducing yeah. the friction, right? And making the piano play more smoothly. Going through and doing that to every, every whippin. Um, she had a tool, I forget what metal it was created from off the hand, but um, it was basically like maybe like a steel, knitting needle or something and she would burnish the jack toe and then the top of the jack with that in order again i believe to reduce the friction and um again those are things that if you don't got a lot of time or you know you might cut those kind of things out right or if you're just trying right. to she burnishes the the top of the balancier where the window is and the top of the jack. Exactly. And the jack toe. And the jack toe and mm -hmm. the cushion. Yes. Yeah. And that, that heating uh, with, a, with like a heated metal, like a knife works well. Um, she does yeah. that, I believe, also right to the cushion, um, to the jack. Yeah, to the cushion. That's right. Repetition. She doesn't burn the cushion. She does that heat thing yeah. yeah 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, so those are some things that just stand out to me. Like, okay, those are really, they seem like really fine details that many people may not be able to get to even, right? Oh, I'm on a budget. I've got this job to do. I'll do this and this and this, you know, and I might not get to that. And I think to me, that just says, if you get the budget and you get the more time, these are the things that you need to do. Or if you pay attention to these type of things, you'll be able to do the quality of work that will get you the budget to do what you need to do to do a great job. It's kind of the way it but comes you know, across the reason, I agree with that. And the reason that Sally Phillips is in a way so successful with, with um, you know, everything she does is because she has no fear really in saying, look, I, this piano needs this work. And you need to find a way to let me do it, to, to, to find the money for me to do it in a university or a concert, in a concert situation with a well-endowed, she just demands that, I, look, I need this time. And see, and she says she sees what they do. And most of the time, you know, they say, you know, okay. Then you can do this, you know, I've been burnishing, uh, you know, Balancier windows in the top of Jack's for 30 years, but I never thought about burnishing the, uh, the Jack toe or somehow lubricating the, the let off button. The, that felt, that's, wow, okay, okay. Or running a hot knife on the whip and heel cushion, you know. I thought Teflon powder would be okay and put in a little Teflon powder in there. But it's, it's just fascinating what you can learn from people that have had a hundred times more concert experience and, you know, no BS recording studio, you know, just like upper tier, you know, kind of piano situations. It's really fascinating to learn from those people. Um, it really is. Um, and that's why this conference was, I thought, and not <laughs> trying to toot my own horn, but I thought they were really good teachers. And I thought there was a ton of practical as well as, you know, kind of internal and, you know, the, the Zen of motorcycle maintenance kind of uh, 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 stuff too by uh, a surprising number of the teachers. I was thrilled. Yeah, you know how you how you are on the inside when you practice your craft. So, uh, anything else from Sally that was especially uh, noteworthy? Well, thing? I'll just transition to a couple of things that are more general, um, at, inspired by what you're saying. You know, this is a first time thing, so you know we didn't know how, how it was going to go, what were going to be the advantages, the disadvantages, whatever. Um, one thing you mentioned the quality of the instructors. Um, I think, you know, almost every instructor had this kind of moment where they say, well, I'm very honored to be part of these, these instructors, or they might say, these are some of my mentors that are here, you know? So I think that was a good sign that we had a good group of instructors, but not only in saying that the majority of the instructors attended each other's lectures, um, yes. which isn't always the case. I mean, some people have a certain level of experience and they go, okay, you know, I've got a lot to do. I've got a lot of my hands. I don't need, you know, any further. I don't need to put my time into this education or that education. And to, to see that people being present at each other's lectures and really taking an interest in learning things and saying you know, one of the comments that we got, this was actually from one of the participants I'm paraphrasing was that, Hey, I've been working in pianos for 50 plus years and I learn new things, you know, as part of this convention. And that says a lot about 
you know, not only the quality of the instructors, but what they decided to bring to the table, to bring, to bring really valuable stuff to the table. Another advantage uh, that, I, that I am inspired to mention is just the, we had kind of like a, I almost, I mean, it was just my feeling of like a family that kind of got built over the course of three yeah. days because I've been doing these lectures individually. And of course we see a lot of the same people um, that participate in the master classes, but never before where you could see, you'd sell the same people in every class three times a day for three days and, uh, and the instructors. And I definitely felt something special about the cohesiveness as like a, a little micro organism of a group started to build um, over the course of the convention. So I thought that was pretty cool. Very intimate in, in a way. It's fascinating. I went to um, Euro Piano, which is the kind of like the national PTG conference in Europe. They have it every three years and it's about the same size as the national PTG conference, a little smaller maybe. But there's basically at these conferences, English speakers and German speakers. So the German speakers all go to the same you know, 12 classes and the American or uh, the English speakers go to all the same 12, 14 classes, whatever it is over a three or four day period, four day period. And it's fantastic. Because it is, you get all, there's all these other people and you're hello. And it's just, it's amazing. You're spending, you know, five or six hours a day with this, with this cohort of humans, you know, it's that are, that are all obsessive piano people. And it's, a, it's, it's a unique situation and that's one of the things that was so good about this and uh, a weird benefit of zoom is that sometimes in a class you're way in the back and there's people you know there's you can't maybe if you want to you can't really focus in zoom man it's just you and the instructor in a way you can focus completely and in a much different way. Yeah, agreed. Um, so maybe let's jump on to another lecture. I mean, we can jump back to Sally if there's something else that comes up, but she, you know, just a little quick summary of her thing and maybe we'll move on. She, you know, we got to be in her home workshop. She's moved uh, from her piano store, which she had um in georgia there and she's working mostly from home now and she just kind of she still she has a bunch of store she, she still has a store she yeah. doesn't work there um she yeah she did she went through a lot of she went through a lot of pains to set up like little centers with with the different tools and uh parts and things set up so we could go she could kind of take us around and show us different things in there so that was that was pretty great um so Let's shift to, how about Bill? Um, so Bill talked last, um, and for some reason, <laughs> forgetting his last name, you know his, Bill, his last name, David. Bill, I'm, I'm just like blanking. I'm having a senior moment on Bill's last name. <laughs> Bill? Yeah, from, our, from the... <laughs> For the yeah, our last lecture, he's a good friend. We meet him regularly. William. Oh, <laughs> Bill Monroe. Bill Monroe. Yeah. Bill Monroe. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyways, Bill was our last lecture um, for the convention. Oh, I think he did a he did an excellent job. Um, and he talked a, a lot about just the general kind of conundrum of of selling work to your clients, you know, it's interesting that he, he actually like, chose that word in his title. Um, but yep. the whole lecture, he was kind of reiterating that he doesn't really sell anybody anything. Um, he's, he's very hands off uh, when it comes to pressuring clients to do work. But 
on the opposite side of that, which I think is is less common for for technicians, is he is hands on in terms of giving them lots of information and saying you could do this, you could do this, you know, here's what this would do, here's what this would do, and he puts a lot of proposals out there for work for people, and then he lets them take it from there. Um, and That's, it's yeah. brilliant. It's brilliant. Everybody goes to that. There's even a chance that they're going to do some work on their piano. He diagnoses the piano. He's a great diagnostician. Diagnoses the piano. Takes probably 15 or 20 minutes. Quickly fills out an evaluation sheet. Then follows up with the client. Sends them the sheet. And in a conversation says, you know, there's a lot we could do to your piano to make it sound and feel better. And here's basically what you can do. And gives them some kind of guesstimate of if you wanted to do everything or if we could do part of it. And then they know. And that's his whole deal. I've, I've, I've told them exactly the truth about their piano. There's no, oh, this is going to come up or, you know, well, in four years, da, da, da. It's like what you need now to make this piano feel a lot better. And a lot of times it's just a day of work. It's $1,000 worth of work or maybe a partial, a partial restoration with new bass strings and a you know, rebuilt key for day of work, uh, you know, four or 5,000 bucks, three, four or 5,000 bucks, whatever. But they know, they know exactly what they're in for from the beginning. And I think that's brilliant. You, Ethan? Yeah, another thing that I took away from his lecture um, is the way he thinks about the higher order consequences of the work that he recommends and the work that he does. So he's, he's not one of these technicians that says, Oh, I only work on Steinways or I only do, you know, this, this really intense quality of, of work, you know, or a certain brand, or you need to invest a certain amount of money uh, in order to do the work. So he'll do grandma's piano you know, and, and put it in the finest shape that it can be that, uh, that, that they'll appreciate. Um, but he, he was talking about, like somebody said, you know, what, what do you do when you have a, something that you do that, you know, you're going to do it and, and they're, they're not going to appreciate it, or it's not going to add value to the piano or something like that. And I think the way that he put it was if they're going to come back and, and they're going to find something out, right? And they're going to say, hey, you know, you recommended that I recover these keys and now, you know, somebody else took a look at it and it wasn't worth doing that. Or um, the, the sort of I, what I would call the second, third, fourth order higher consequences of what's going on. And, and that's how he decides whether or not he's going to do certain types of work. And that doesn't necessarily preclude him from um, doing work on, pianos that might often be neglected, right? Like it's not like a major uh, Steinway or Baldwin, Mason and Hamlin, something like that. Um, but a piano that could really benefit from him putting some work into it and the person's willing to invest some money and they're gonna be happy because they're gonna get what they wanted out of it. Um, and so he, he, doesn't, he doesn't have guilt about the work that he does. And I think it's because uh, he really focuses on informing the client and giving them what they want and making sure they're going to be happy, not just tomorrow, but five years down the line. And that, that his reputation is going to um, hold up, you know, to the scrutiny of, of what he's worked on. Do you think that's a, a fair a, representation? It is a fair representation. Absolutely. It is. It was just his class was outstanding. He uh, kind of defined professionalism as it as it applies to piano technicians and piano professionals. And it was just it was like any other 
uh, you know, professional that was interacting with, you know, the public or especially coming into the public's house, but just an impeccable, you know, sweet, good-hearted, kind, uh, uh, you know, smart, funny man, but a complete professional with his clients, total professional with his clients, uh, from his paperwork to his work on their pianos, to the way he looks when he shows up, to what he says and the way he talks. And, you know, it just, it was inspiring. Yeah, Ethan? He prefaced the class with saying that when he, when he first started teaching the class and teaching the things that he taught within this class, he thought that maybe it was for beginners, you know, just kind of hear the fundamentals of what you need to do when you get out there and do good piano work for your clients. And he said the more that more experienced people saw it and they said, no, I found that very valuable. Um, the more he realized it wasn't some sort of a, just a you know entry level class. And I think that piggybacking on what you said, he talked a bit about just sort of standards of excellence, I guess is a good way to put it. And he talked about it mostly upfront, um, but he talked about it all throughout the lecture. And yeah, it's those things where you, you hear them and you go, oh yeah, that's, that's right. I do care about that, but am I exemplifying that? You know, he gave examples of things like, um, well, you know, I think about how I present myself to the client, you know, or you want to think about the way you present yourself to the client down to, you know, the car that you drive and, you know, what time you arrive and um, the, the level of professionalism that you exhibit when you're speaking with them or you're sitting in front of their piano working on it or how you place your tools in the ground when you're, um, when you have to set them out, you know, or however you put things in order. And I think that uh, it makes sense what he said about how, yes, these are things that are fundamentals as you get out there, but a lot of people maybe never got them as fundamentals. It was never kind of presented along here. Here are the fundamentals. He did a very thorough job of laying out a bunch of details. Um, but then on top of that, people who are more experienced, they just, they might agree with what he said, but have completely lost touch with it. And it's, it was a great place to, to reconnect with essential things that are important. Uh, if you're a professional football player or a baseball player or basketball player, from your first year in the professional league to your last year in the professional league, good coaches force you, compel you to go back to the fundamentals, to go back to just the very fundamental drills and practices and moves that you started to do when you were a kid and that are done all the way through until you retire. And it's the same with us. We need to be reminded. We're not, you sitting there all alone in your little, you know, on your little island of piano technology, which most of us do, most of us work in isolation. Um, sometimes you don't feel like, oh, well, I, I need these upper, upscale classes, but I don't need this, this real basic stuff. I've got that. It's great to revisit it. It's great to remember. It's great to feel, oh yeah, that's, I felt excited about this stuff when I started out, you know, or I learned how to be excited about this stuff at a certain level of maturity that I achieved. It's really good. Practice is good. Revisiting is good. Uh, the reason that if you have a mindfulness practice, the reason you do it every day is so you get better at it, you know? Same thing with this. Agreed. Um, 
like, so, you know, I've, some things have been coming in the chat. So I'm, what I'm going to do is take a minute and just read through some of this stuff to make sure that it's. Oh, nice. yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a tef, Teflon controversy in the chat. A Teflon controversy. <laughs> um, I'll just read a couple of things and. Uh, and we'll see if we if they need further discussion or just to kind of give them voice here. Um, Larry said earlier on, it'd be interesting to see electron microscope photos of hammers treated with lacquer versus those not. Definitely would be interested. I'm sure somebody's got to have done something like that, no? Have you seen anything? Maybe the, that was the elect. Maybe that's what what the situation of the hammers were in that picture that Stan would show. It could Maybe. be. Maybe I think you're right, though. I think it was, I think it was hot and cold pressed. I think actually, I think you're yeah. right. It, yeah, I think that. I think I am too. But I would love to see that. I think it probably does the same kind of thing. I would imagine the lacquer does that same kind of packing together thing. Yeah. So it may pack together, or maybe I guess could fill the sort of gaps right and then and then yeah. it, I, don't, I wonder if you could see it under the microscope if you see if the gaps are clear just because the um the solution is clear that you're um using right like the lacquer itself or if you uh might uh sort of like see them filled in like you could see like it's just literally more of a mass you know like a structure just yeah like a, you want to yeah. unmute Larry and ask him what he thinks? Sure. Let's see. Where is Larry? I think Larry can unmute himself if he wants. Um, let me make sure I have that capacity. Larry, what's your feeling about that? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, From a very early part of my career, I, I had a mentor who had, he had worked with the Steinway. He knew the Steinway brothers himself um, had worked in the factory and he questioned them a lot about the use of lacquer. And he told me that they said they never used lacquer before World War II. Uh, if they had to harden hammers at all, they would, they would use uh, shellac um, and very, very sparingly. And then after the war, when the German felt hammers were no longer available to them and they had to rely on American makers, the felt was very soft and they were forced to use lacquer. Um, but he said they didn't like it and, but they felt they had no option. So I've always been wary of using lacquer myself. And uh, I've also experienced that um, once you put the lacquer in, it's there forever and you've basically turned the hammer into a piece of plastic or a rock and uh, so i've always sought other methods of of hardening hammers and improving the tone of soft hammers um, and there are lots of ways to do that i i discovered uh, so i use it hardly ever or very sparingly um, but it would be interesting to see those electron microscope photographs to, to get a picture of exactly what is happening yeah. to the hand when you it, do that. It, it would be fascinating. And Larry, could you just give us a couple of different protocols that you use to get a hammer up and, uh, uh, besides lacquer? Sure. Um, I like what the um, battery voicing technique, which was pioneered by um, Andre. Yes, Andre Orbeck. Mm -hmm. That seems to work very nicely. Um, just simply ironing hammers works mm -hmm. wonderfully well. Uh, going through progressively finer grades of sandpaper, all these things can really bring the tone up quite a lot, and none of them are irreversible, which lacquer is. Uh, so there are those things and um, many other things, uh, acoustic changes that you can make in the room to the location of the piano can often affect a, a really big change in tone. So I always try to 
go through all those options first. If I'm forced to use lacquer, I drop it in one drop at a time on the side of the hammer. I put the action stack on its side and apply little drops of lacquer in the shoulders on both sides, but never directly onto the striking surface of the hammer. Thank you so much, man. That was awesome. Oh, thank it. you. I appreciate you sharing that. Thanks so much. Um, should I go on to the next comment? Yeah. All right. Uh, Johan Krebs said, I visited Renner in the 1990s asking for softer hammers, almost impossible at that time. I was told this practically manufacturers then wanted extra hard hammers, a big journey to the preference for the softer hammer today. Hmm. Yeah. Um, You're right. Yeah, there's a I've, I've lived it. I've lived it as a so-called high-end piano technician over the past 30 years. Uh, the first sets of, the first many sets of Renner hammers that I used to retrofitted pianos were tough, man. You know, the, 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 the pre-voicing protocol that, that is in the book Voice of the Piano by Andre Orubik uh, was almost kind of like the minimum you did with some of those sets of hammers. You had to really, really needle the hell out of them to get any kind of a good, warm piano or mezzo voice. And the hammers we're getting now are like ridiculously beautiful uh, in comparison to the hammers that we got even 20 years ago. They're just, I think the whole upper end of the piano business has realized that long, good wool fibers treated with as few chemicals as possible and then heated to a low temperature relatively, 110, 115 degrees for a shorter period of time is the way to make springier, better hammers that sound great out of the box man i have i have pulled sets of um renner and to a certain extent able abel uh hammers out of the box over the past three four five years that have just blew me away i only really had to do check all the low shoulders and they were all pretty much free and do a bit of high shoulder voicing. It was, it was amazing. And uh, I'd love some other people to talk about that too. Um, this turn toward much softer hammers. And then the Chinese piano industry mimicking that. Play a Baldwin, play a new Baldwin that was made in China in the Parsons factory. It's, the hammers are nice, you know? The uh, top of the food chain Highland pianos, and the, uh, the, the, the hammers are nice. So. You have way more experience uh, watching the hammers trends from the 90s to today. So I don't know if yeah. I have much more to say. <laughs> okay. um, uh, I'll move on to the next, uh, it was sort of a question here from Pat. Uh, brush the whip cushions before ironing. That's a good question. And I don't remember, Do you, David, did you have a comment on that? I, I, I don't use the iron. I use a Teflon powder on a scrap of felt or, or some you know, transfer device like that. Um, I have a suede brush that, especially if there's a divot in the whipping cushion, and a lot of times there is, I use a brush to kind of like, you know, make the divot a little less divity and then, then lubricate it. Yeah, I'm, I don't remember Sally saying that she brushed them first. Um, 
But I think that the general uh, intention there is to reduce friction and sort of make them a smoother quality. Um, exactly and so right. it could be that brushing them first does have an advantage because you can um, kind of, kind of what I David said, like, rough out the, the irregularities yeah. so that it's more uniform. And then after you iron it, it That's becomes true. flatter. Yeah. In older weapons, the capstan kind of digs in. It can't dig in the weapon cushion. It depending on what kind of quality backing they put on it and a lot of things I, I, I would imagine. But on on some weapons I've seen there's there's quite quite the mark from the capstan. So brushing that out, making it more smooth and less irregular is really good. Cool. Um, and I'll, I'll say this real quick. We're, we're going to hop off in 10 minutes, but um, before we hop off officially, I'm going to do for the people who filled out our feedback survey, we want to make sure we got uh, reviews of as many of our individual lectures as possible. Um, so uh, yeah, people who filled that out, we're giving away a hundred dollar Amazon gifts, gift card. So to be fully transparent and fair about it, I'll just pull up the spreadsheet in a little bit and click a random number generator and we'll find out who gets that gift certificate. Yeah. So, kind of um, so I'll do that before oh, we go. Really yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, but we'll move back, back on to the, to the comments here. Cause this is interesting stuff. Um, and then maybe, maybe in just the last minute, maybe I'll do a rapid fire. Cause we haven't even covered all the different lectures that we had. Maybe I'll just like walk through each of them and say walk something through interesting each. quick. Yeah. That's right. Um, Save five for that because that's good. Save yeah. five for that. Cool. Um, all right. Let's see here. We go to this. Uh, go to this Teflon powder comment from Johan. Uh, Teflon powder has become an accepted lubricant in the piano industry, especially since uh, I read a big expose about it last week. I think it was in the Guardian or the BBC, which made me rethink the use of it for serious health effects and its effect on the environment. Mentioned been found in human fetuses and in polar bears. We should think about inhaling it when applied with a brush as Teflon is not digestible when it has entered lung cells. Some colleagues say that they are careful. Others I see sitting in a cloud of it as they brush it on. Well, that's very useful. I'm glad I read through that. Um, Pat said, no need for a cloud of it. A little goes a long way. I like to use a scrap of hammer felt. That's, that's what David said he uses as well. David Boyce says, Teflon controversies pop up from time to time. A client of mine years ago was a plastic expert at IBM and he was very reassuring. Okay, good to, so there's, yeah. Yeah, like there's the been, sides of this. It, it comes up every once in a while and uh, I've seen articles that test that beyond a shadow of a doubt, there has to be like a, you have to breathe it in like cocaine in order for it to do any damage at all. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. you need a lot of it to do that kind of damage they're talking about. Yeah, I suppose lead and keys has kind of got that similar kind of, you got to be really careful with it. Most people who handle it often are careful and they say as long as they're careful, they feel like, you know, they're safe. Um, I've even heard people doing testing around the lead um, and finding that they're fine, you know, when they they're tested for lead levels, even though they might handle yep. it often for, for key yep. jobs. Yeah. Um, uh, Spurlock, uh, Larry Lovell said Spurlock, Bill Spurlock, iconic piano technician inventor in our community investigated the safety of Teflon before we started selling it, convinced it was safe to use. Yeah. Um, I just use teeny little, little bits of it on little teeny, Paint brushes or scraps of felt. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. Although, you know, I wouldn't want to pour it all over me or breathe right into it or something like that. Um, so, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring up like a the convention booklet, and we can sort of look through each of the lectures that was that's listed there. Um, oh. just to remind which one's which and say something quick about it. Let's see here. 
Okay. So day one, we had Alex Kirsten. We talked quite a bit about that. Isaac Sadigursky tool tactics. Um, people were really excited about that. It's, uh, yeah. it's drinking, drinking from a fire hose, uh, turning an encyclopedia, uh, one page per second. Uh, he had a, a wonderfully prepared presentation, bringing on all sorts of toolkits and tips and suggestions. Um, I think it's one of those things you could both watch in the moment, pick up some things that you'll take with you and also go back to it and say, oh, how did you do that? And you can go check it out and, and remember. Um, Arlen, he's got an amazing practice. That, that's just amazing. I, I, would, I would literally explode if given that practice. I, there's no way I could do it, but he's just a master of tools and organization yeah. of parts and objects uh, relating to pianos. It's amazing. You uh, always Ar Arlen Harris uh, gave a great lecture talking about uh, full day grand vertical spiff up packages, uh, really trying to take into account the current state of affairs and you know how are you gonna approach um, your clients during quarantine? Maybe they have a budget because the, the money's not flowing as easily. Here's some ways where you can do some great work. You're happy because you you did a job that you that you appreciate, but they're happy because you did it within a budget. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought Arlen is a consummate professional. It was really great. Consummate time. professional, and this is a man that's tuned hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands, of concerts in venues all over the world, and yet he comes back and works on just regular good pianos in just regular people's houses. And he's trying to figure out ways for himself and us to make money and thrive through this thing. He's just a great guy. What a, what a sweet community we actually have. You know what I mean? Definitely. It was a pr privilege to have him part of it. Also incredibly humble, Arlen. <laughs> he was just, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Um, day, day two here, Debbie Sear, um, uh, if you want to take a part of piano, she's done it over and over again with all these students at North Bennett Street. And they just have protocols now and they've made all the mistakes, you know, I'm sure they'll make more, but right. you know, she, the, the material that she presented, she had inherited from someone else just to make it clear how well documented every little piece of the process is. Um, and uh, I had one of the participants say, Oh, I, I watched that today, you know, a few days after I took a <laughs> grand, grand piano part for rebuilding. I was kicking myself that I didn't have some of the tips. Um, so that was, yeah, it was a great lecture. It's um, amazing. And it's, it's, it's why not have a discreet, awesome, tried and true protocol that you can, that you can just immediately adapt and apply. Awesome. Awesome. So David Stanwood next. Um, we talked a bit about that. Um, just some great concept. I would say three things, uh, you know, talking about voicing all the way also from the, the sheep to the concert hall, but um, putting some science in there and some interesting history. And it was kind of a sort of culturally rich, in interesting presentation. Um, David Anderson, we know, I think I've heard of this guy. The, I, I just thought of something wonderful to say about your presentation. It'll be kind of like mystical. He's, he makes the piano sing at the beginning and he sings at the end, which, uh, <laughs> which is pretty incredible without, without uh, giving a spoiler. Um, yeah, David gave a great lecture on tuning, but also um, at the end of it, he shared some some singing upon the recommendation of uh, Carl Lieberman, who said he enjoyed a previous lecture where he sang. It was excellent. I'm not going to ask you to say anything about your own lecture, David. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Sally Phillips, we talked about that a bit. Um, just details and, uh, you know, looking at, she had a lot of demonstrations to show really great stuff. Uh, somebody mentioned this, to not forget to bring up Steve Brady, dampers from the ground up. That was an incredible comprehensive story of dampers all the way from 
if you're replacing them and doing rebuilding to, you know, how do you get rid of that sound or how do you optimize this hammer that's totally non, or sorry, this damper that's totally non-functional? How do you deal with the felt? How do you deal with the wire? Um, how do you deal with sort of design issues and design flaws? So he came at it from every angle, well diagrammed. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, it was awesome. And so simple, everything, everything, he just, he, his teaching is very clear. The way he approaches things is very simple, I find. Very clear. Doesn't get it that very much. He's a really practical piano technician. And it, it, it's very easy to replicate what he says. And, you know, dampers have been my terror my whole uh, uh, life as a piano technician. He makes it really, there's a couple of people that I've, taking their classes that make it easy, that make it seem simple. And he just, he just did it. It was amazing. And uh, very relevant to me. Very great job. Very, very well done. Um, finally, Bill Monroe, we talked a bit about that. Um, he, uh, he just great, gave a lot of sense of professionalism, but also like just, you know, thinking very clearly about your practice and, and your, uh, you know, economics of it and the customer relationship side of it. And um, he didn't go into details about how do you perform these various tasks, but it was more about how do you consider pitching these various jobs and putting them together. So it was really, really but, useful that way. And diagnosing what's exactly wrong. With them. Also, Fantastic. yeah. Uh, Somebody, was that a mistake? Somebody said something. Yeah, I think it was just a... Mike, um, okay. I um, just, I'm, I, yeah, go ahead. I just want to say 30 seconds it was an yeah. incredible honor to be included in this stellar group of <laughs> instructors. And, um, you know, I was so happy to bring something that I was, that I really cared passionately about to this and could share with people. So. Thank you so much, everybody that was there. And thank you, Ethan. Yeah, thank you, of let's, course. Let's Thanks. get out of here. We're, we're over let time. Me, let me do this raffle thing real quick, and, um, oh, yeah. and then we'll sign off. Yeah, we, we missed out on that. Yes. So let me get back there. Can That's you fine. see this spreadsheet? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to make it really quick and easy. Um, I'm going to click sort on this line of the spreadsheet, and then whoever's email is at the top here, uh, they're, they're the winner, and I'll reach out to them if they're not here. And that is Mike at iFix Pianos. That's Mike Magnus. So, Mike oh, Magnus. Wow. Congratulations, brother. We'll reach out to you. We'll, we'll send you that your uh, gift certificate, and you can geek out on Amazon for whatever you like. And then I will just say very quickly before we sign off, we're going to do another convention. This one went really well, and so there will be another one in March it's going to be the 18th to the 20th. We're in preparations now. So if, if it was busy season in December, I know a lot of you weren't able to make it because you just needed to make a buck. Um, that's totally fine, but we're going to do it again. So keep your eye out for it. Any last words, David? This has been great. Another fabulous radio hour. Thank you so much. Our radio hour community for being here. You, you really can't know how deeply we appreciate it, Ethan and I. Thank you, Ethan, best partner ever. Uh, we'll see you, lovely folks. Not next week. Oh, right? not next week. Yeah, we're taking the week off next week. Not next week. The week after that. Happy Kwanzaa and Hanukkah and Christmas and everything. Yeah. Um, and... Thank you and good day and good and evening. Good day. Wherever you are, and make it be good. All right. Take bye -bye. a breath. Make it be good. See you later.